What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and don't forget, leave a comment. Go ahead and hit that like. I got a special guest on today, man. Did a lot of time in some dangerous places. But you know what? I think it's better that he introduces himself and tells you a little bit about who he is, where he's from. James, you got the mic, brother. Tell the people who you are. I'm James. I'm from Missouri, Springfield, Missouri, to be exact. Um, I started off in Beaumont, Texas, ended up going to uh, Tucson, Arizona. And then when that yard flipped over, I ended up in Victorville. Um, from there, I went to the, we opened up the SMU program up in Lewisburg. And then when I, I got out for a few short months and ended up coming back to Canaan USP, um, while I was incarcerated, I was tipped up with the Dirty White Boys at that time. I want to talk a little bit about how you ended up in prison, man. How old were you when you got arrested? So it start. So I, I start. I've been in prison. So I've been at this. I, what we talked about before we got on here is I, I work and live in a faith based recovery community. Right. And I've been here for about seven years. Up until I came here, I spent more life my, of my life in prison than I did in the world. I started going to prison when I was 17. So in 2003, I finished off a state, a state bit. Six months later, I caught two 10-year state sentences in a federal case for a felon in possession of a firearm. I finished all that off in 2013. So what was your first prison, Beaumont? Yeah, Beaumont, Beaumont USB. How old were you when you walked into Beaumont? 20s in my 20s late, late early late 20s i was 20 something i started losing my hair in beaumont i can't imagine why you go into beaumont you're a young man are you thinking in your head like damn man why the hell would they send me to this place i've never seen anything like that in my life it was a whole different experience like i you know i had been involved i had been involved in violence my whole life but that was a whole different level to it i'd never been around that many kind of uh penitentiary gangs and the structure type violence that was going on there. I embraced it. I thought it was because, you know, I come from a state joint where individuals would check or pass. They got pressed or extorted and things like that. Well, you get to a federal USP and people are getting life lighted off the yard for those things. So when I seen that, I just I, I embraced it. And that's what you embraced it. So how much time did you have, you said? So I had two, I started in 2004, I caught two 10 year state sentences and a nine, I think it was 92 month federal sentence. I paroled from the state penitentiary in 2007 to federal prison and I finished my federal bit in 2013. So you get over to federal prison with that time, are you thinking, you said you embraced the violence. Were you, I mean, did getting out matter to you? You know, after the first couple of years, no. When I was in that, uh, I didn't think about it. I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't think I was going to make it out of there. It's like whenever I was in Beaumont and I started hanging out with the individuals that I was hanging out, you know, the guy that I kind of, he took me under his wing. He, uh, he told me, you know, he had a life sentence and he was telling me, he's like, bro, you ain't got, you ain't got that much time, but I didn't care. And he took, you know, I did my time. Like I had a life sentence cause I was an idiot and I embraced that stupid stuff. And uh, I didn't think I didn't think I would make it out like I didn't it didn't even register that there would be. I thought in my mind that I was making a way for the rest of my life in this prison. That's what I thought. I feel like you wanted to make sure you laid down a reputation. I don't think it was about that. Maybe subconsciously. It wasn't really never. I don't I don't think I some of it, maybe, you know, obviously, you know, as well as I do when you start putting in work, you want to make sure everybody knows what you're doing and things like that. But it wasn't, I don't, I, I don't, it wasn't just that. I don't think, I don't think so. It was about if I'm going to live in this crazy environment, I'm going to go all the way out. With it. That's what I'm going to do. And it took hold. You end, up, you end up tipping up with the dirty white boys. Do you do that in Beaumont? Yeah. Yeah. So when I got there, you know, there was like five Missouri dudes there. And uh, I was in a unit with about four or five DWBs. And I that's who I that's who I talked to, that's who I ate with and things like that. And there was another DWB that was from um, that was from Missouri. And we got to talk and we knew some of the same people from the state joints and stuff like that. I didn't really click with the other the dudes from Missouri that were there. I talked to them. You know, we were riding together the first. The first thing I did in Beaumont was with a Missouri, another Missouri dude. I hit a dude, 
my first month in the place, me and another dude jumped on a dude. And, and uh, that was my first thing. I, I just didn't really vibe with them too much. So I always, I gravitated more towards the dirty white boys. And that's who I, that's who I started hanging out with when I was there. You say you went on a mission as soon as you got there and you jumped on the dude, you stab him, beat him up. What happened? No, we just, we just kicked, you know, the boots they give you, I just kicked his head in. We just, uh, we just, uh, I got him down, I knocked him down and kicked his face in. What was his violation, man? What, what, what caused you to have to do that? He ended up telling the officers on another inmate about something that happened in the kitchen over some stuff getting stolen out of the kitchen. So it was something real small. And, you know, some people don't understand. You always get them dudes that work in the kitchen that think they're like, you know, like, hey, man, I'm I'm, I'm part of the team over here. I'm, I'm part of the administration. Hey, don't steal this shit. You get yeah. guys like that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, that's where a lot of people made money in those places. And, this, and uh, he just did something stupid and said the wrong thing and, on somebody. So we ended up smashing him out for it. And I know that there was kind of like a, a riot with the Pisces and stuff in Canaan. We're going to get there in a minute, but yeah. How long were you in Beaumont? A little over a year before they turned it into a uh, to a a medium. It was too violent; they couldn't contain it no more. So they end up turning that into a medium. Is that why you get transferred? Yeah. yeah so they started this thing. Have you ever heard of something called the pilot program? <laughs> Did you know? Yeah. So they started a pilot program in Beaumont where you like you do 30 days in the hole and then they put you in this little pilot program. And uh, I think we, I, me and about three other dudes, three other bros at the time, we was in the pilot program for like two months and they came and told us that we were all being transferred, that if you were a violent offender or a gang member, that it was becoming a medium facility. So they were going to be transferring us all out. I want to ask you a little bit about this because so many, you, you see all these prison channels and, People are talking about, you know, gang this and gang that. What's it like when you're prospecting for a gang, man? How, how long did you do? I did 18 years. Okay, so so you got two types of individuals. Like like Russo was talking about, you know, some you see some individuals that they choose that because they fear of being without it, right? They think that they have to have a large body of individuals. So and what happens with people like that, they get ducked out and sent on all these stupid things and all this stupid stuff. Well, with me, um, because that's not the type of time I was on, obviously I had to put put in some work. You know, that's why I was in the pilot program. So that's what that's what that consisted of. Did you feel like, man, I really want to be a part of these guys? Like, these are my dudes. This is my family. I did. What got me was, as you know, as well as I do, if you don't have that same ink, that you can't really be a part of that. And I've never been one to be what you call an associate. That wasn't never one of my things. I couldn't, I, I wasn't going to do that. So I figured it was all in. And that's what I, that's what I chose to do. That's what it is. It's all in because, you know, people are built different. Sometimes dudes are like, like you said, associates. And I'm just going to call it what it is on the channel, right? I used to look at dudes like that, man, like dick riders, bro. You know, excuse my language on here, but the ice like, man, this dude's a lame, man. He's just, you know, he's just hanging out. And we had dudes around us where dudes, I didn't really like these dudes, man, but they were like associates. You know what I mean? And I just, I didn't care for them, bro. Did you feel that way sometimes about dudes? At the time, yeah. That's where, that's why. And whenever I had this conversation with one of the people there and uh, I can't, I couldn't put myself in that category. So it was either like. I, I had to make, I made a choice. I was either going to be all in or I was going to have to break contact with, with those guys. And I didn't want to do that because I liked, I liked what I seen at the time. At the time, but I'm glad that you learned. So now you end up leaving Beaumont. Where do you go next? So they sent us to a new joint that opened up Tucson, Arizona, and they put us at, well, so half of the, the DWBs went to, um, McQuarrie, they had opened up a yard in Kentucky, I think it was, McQuarrie. And then we went to, half of us went to uh, Tucson. And I think well, I think I was there a little over a year, man. And a lot of stuff happened in that yard too, man. There was a lot of stuff going on there. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. Everyone thinks, oh man, Tucson's a check-in yard and a sex offender yard. It wasn't always oh, that way. It wasn't, no. When they, So that's what I said. So you know about one we're going to chow one day and then they they told us they're blocking off was the a side or whatever right they blocked it off and then one day they start blacking out all the windows 
right? And they start busting people in at night and you can't get over there. There's no way. Normally you can usually dip off on, you couldn't, they had it, they had it locked down. Well, we started figuring out they were putting uh, homosexual individuals, um, people that had testified on people and things like that. And then one night um, they came and called us all into the units and told us we would be getting transferred to different facilities. If you weren't, yeah, if your custody level was too high or if you weren't a government witness or whatever they had going on. Sex offender, right? Yeah, sex offender and things like that. Now it's like a, almost a complete sex offender jail, I think. That's what I heard. So they they fit, they sent the first wave out. And I guess if you didn't have like any violent shots, they were trying to like transition people into that yard. So within the first couple of months after they did that, people were getting stabbed every day. It was just a, yeah, I I was on the first wave out. They sent, they sent buses, multiple buses out like fast and got us all out of there. Didn't, it didn't take long. So you don't stay at Tucson long, right? You leave. Where do you end up going next? We went to Victorville. I was in Victorville, and that was a whole different ball game. I'd never, uh, you know, the West Coast thing is a whole different, whole different thing. No problem for the homeboys over there, right? The DWBs were able to walk over there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we went straight to the yard. So as soon as you get there, man, who's got the yard over there? AB's got the yard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess. You- I guess it's from your different. It's from what perspective? You know what I'm saying. So, like, we did our thing and they did their thing, but, te- yeah, they had the yard. Well, that's that's where I was going with it, right? Because, you know, I've been places where the ABs thought they had the yard, like in Big Sandy. And then when we yeah. showed up, it's like, we don't care about you, dude. I mean, that's – for us, it was like, man, okay, you guys got a reputation, but yeah. we're building one. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's one of those things where it's like, like, no disrespect to anybody. Um, I actually have – we've got – new uh kind of cool with some individuals over there and um uh but in my mind all i cared about was our thing so whatever the stuff that they had going on with other regular people that they were doing with other people don't bring that stuff to me you just keep that stuff over there and that's kind of the mentality it was there with that did they respect you guys yeah i mean to my face well, yeah, I mean, we know that because they talk behind your back sometimes, you know. I've, I've experienced that where they're, you know. I got, I'll got. i say this, man. I get. I got along just, you know, I got along really well with the, some of the individuals that was there. I didn't I didn't get involved in what they had going on, you know what I mean? But, yeah, not, not a problem with that. But Victorville is definitely a dangerous place, right? Very, yeah, I got into some stuff there. Uh, yeah, I got into some stuff there, jumped on a few. Uh, I. My first week there, they were on a lockdown. As soon as we got we got off of a lockdown, I ended up, we were on our way to the chow hall. And uh, I seen a couple of the bros, they, they seen me, so we're walking to the chow hall. We didn't make it to the chow hall. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the UAB guys from Utah or whatever, or not from uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Oh. The Universal AB guys, or whatever. Anyway, there was a guy there that had wrote some statements on one of one of my guys. So right then, and I wasn't there a full week, man. We hit this dude right there, and uh, ended up going to the hole for that, and then that started it off there. When you talk about you hit him, right? Yeah, no knife, no knife, no knife, no Just knife. No. You ever have to stab anybody in prison? I didn't get caught. I. I was in some things, yeah. Well, we won't talk about details, but you know what we'll talk about is because I want people to understand what the mindset is when they're listening in on the show. Like, you know, we're not just talking about it, dude. Like, you live that life. You know what I mean? Yeah. What goes yeah. through a person's mind when they're like, "Damn, bro, we're gonna have to stab this dude." Like, what? As you, as your adrenaline pumping, are you thinking, "Damn, dude, we might kill well, this I'm dude. I'll never get I'm out." I'm gonna be honest with you. Like, so when I was at Beaumont, when I got there, they were on a lockdown. When I first got to to the place, something happened, and. uh we were there long enough for my paperwork to make it through, right? I got lucky and got a, my PSI got slipped in, right? I didn't even know you couldn't have those things at the time. And it got, I had had somebody, when I was in the federal holdover in Greene County in Missouri, somebody had told me had my lawyer send it to ahead of time. So long story short, I had my stuff. So I had slipped my paperwork so that people knew, people knew why I was in the joint, right? And uh, so 
long story short, somebody slid something under my door in case when we come out that there was an issue with the with a different race. And it's not like that in the state joint. Like people ain't rolling around in Missouri state joints boned up like that. Like that's not, it wasn't, I mean, people had things, but it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? You know, like everybody has something in the feds. Everybody. You know, and I'm and they slide me, you know, typewriter rod, and I'm thinking, dang, what did I just walk myself into? Because I never, like I said, you know, it wasn't like that in, in the state facilities. So it's a definitely, it's one of those things, it's like, it's like uh, when I caught my federal case, I had got caught with a pistol. And the reason why I had to, the reason they were looking for me is because somebody said I tried to shoot at them. So that's why they were looking for me. It's the same thing when you carry a pistol on the streets as it is in prison. You got this thing on you for a reason, not just to show somebody. There's a reason why you got that thing. And there's things that come along with that. And that's why when you, you know, go back to what you asked the question before, like, did you ever think you were getting out? No, I didn't. Because when it comes down to it, you know, that little thing can cost you the rest of your life, you know, and it almost did in, in Tucson. <clears throat> It almost did in Tucson. What happened over there? There was some things that happened in Tucson where there was these two brothers. I can't remember their names. Some things happened and they were getting ran off the yard. And, and it was a big deal. Like the all the white dudes were jumping on these two dudes. They were getting them up off the yard for some things. And I ended up, I ended up, I was in front of the housing unit because some of my people were involved in it inside the unit where one of the guys made it through the door. And he had a he had something in his hand and he got me in the shoulder. And like right here and here, and I had something in my pocket. And luckily I didn't, nobody's life got took in that day. But you know, stuff like that, in the instant, you can just lose it. You know what I mean? So you got stabbed over there at Tucson. Just a yeah, I wouldn't even call it a, I wouldn't even call it a, it was just a little poke. Dude was just fearing for his life. He was trying to get to the captain, he was trying to get to the lieutenant's office as soon as possible. He was trying, they were trying to get up out of there because they were getting, yeah. I understand, man. See, some of the people that are watching, they don't know what's going on, but I know what's going on, but it's all right. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make you talk in detail or even ask Well, you so they were, they were trying to kill these guys and they were trying to get to the lieutenant's office, but they shut the slider door. So he made it, he made it through. The other guy didn't make it through. And when he came through the sliding door, he just jabbed at me with the thing. Well, it made my arm go numb. So I'm left-handed and I had something in my hand and all I, all I could do was back him up, you know, for a minute until I got used to my hand. But. See, that's, that, that's another thing that people don't understand, man. A knife will keep a motherfucker off you in there, right? Pretty much. You know, you got, you got two guys in there, you know, as well as I do. You got that get up off me and you got that murder weapon. <laughs> <laughs> What's one of the worst things you've seen the whole time you were in prison, man? There was a lot of stuff in Beaumont that I'll never forget. There was a lot of things that happened there that I'll never forget. There was some, there was this incident in, um, there was an incident in Tucson that I'll never forget where a guy ended up brain dead because, and ended up, I, he ended up brain dead and, and flopping, foaming at the mouth and things like that. There was a lot of stuff in, in, uh, the wild, the the one that sticks with me, man, that really got me was the incident with the Pisces in Canaan. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty intense. Uh, but the things that went on in Beaumont was was wild, man. The things that happened in Victorville were pretty nuts. The the SNU program was the wildest things ever. Like that was that was like that was just wild, wild west. It was crazy. We were in the Smooth program when they um. Probably when the armed dudes jumped on this kid that his name was Numbers. I want to say he might have. Oh been yeah, there. yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I knew Numbers, and and he was normal when I knew him. And then I seen him years later, and they had beat yeah. him so bad he walked like his arm was like this. Yeah. Like, What's up, Chad? And I was yeah. like, damn, bro, what happened to you? And he's like, hey, man, the armed dudes kicked his head in, man. Yeah, you know there were some of those. You asked me that there were some armed dudes with us in uh, in Arizona too. They were actually on the yard with us too. So. Some of them armed dudes got busy, man. AJ, Raz, Chad, they, they were dangerous. Yeah, Chad was, Chad was, uh, he was next to me in the cage. He'd actually, we were right there when we first started in, in the SMU program. They were right next to us. He was a big ass honky, too, for real. 
I think he was about my size, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. I'm six foot four. Well, there so, you go. Well, there you go. Yeah, he's he's about yeah. six, probably about that tall. Yeah. Definitely, definitely a tough dude. So you end up in Canaan, right? And I want to. Yeah, I, can't, I was back on a violation, so I got out. And you know how the feds work. I got out with a three-year supervised release. Well, I didn't make it, so I ended up going back, and I had to finish off. I had to finish off my time in Canaan, and uh, I had forty-six days until I got out. And I got into an argument with a Paisa. And he said, everything was kind of getting worked itself, working itself out. And then he called me out of my name and I took off on him and ended up getting hit here. I got hit in the liver and hit in the hip. Hit you with ice pick? I think it was a fence. I'm pretty sure it was a piece of fence. What did he call you out of your name for? What was it over? So, you know how in the corner of the housing units where the window where people work out in the corners. So we were up there working out. This dude was new to the, to the yard and we're working out in the corner and he didn't like people working out in front of his, in front of his room. And instead of coming and talking and he kept walking by us, glaring at us and, you know, mumbling under his breath and things like that. Well, then he went back in his room and put his boots on and came out and stood at the balcony watching us. So I finally was like, hey, man, what's going on? He started speaking in Spanish. I was like, look, I don't understand you. So when his people came up there, they got it. They, you know, everything was starting to get worked out. Then you have that one dude, man, that walked up and he's like, we, you know, he, and he's talking that puto stuff. And I took off on him. Did you punch him in the face or hit a stab? Him? Yeah, oh, I dropped, I dropped, I hit him in the face. As soon as he hit the floor, I got hit in the, I got hit in the side. So there was a dude from my roommate. Was a dude from, are you from Boston? Is that where? No. From New York. Okay. Well, there was a dude named Chucky. They call him Chucky D. Redheaded dude from Boston. Boston, yeah. I know who he is. Yeah, he was, a, is. yeah he was He was my roommate when all that stuff happened. So, what, what, I'm, all right, so they stab you. What do the other white dudes do? Are they helping? Are they running? What's going on? Yeah, well, so, so you know, like I said, I, and I'm not trying to come off like a super tough guy either, but I'm a bigger guy. And I've been involved in a lot of stuff like this. So the guys that were with me, it was two, there was two white dudes and a native was over there standing with us. The native got out the way because it didn't concern him. The other dude was just an independent guy they called Hippie. He got stabbed in the spine. He got he got hit in the spine and he he went straight down. Has he got long hair, got a bunch of time in? Yeah, he was from like Oregon or something. I was in Big Sandy with him. Or no, yeah. Lee County. I was in Lee County. Yeah. He he uh he just hit the ground, right? And as soon as everybody started seeing what's going on, people started running. There was another dude named John from Missouri came running up the stairs. They had the, the you know, the Pisces, the Pisces and them started organizing real quick. So they had the stairs blocked off. Well, a dude grabbed the dude's knife and flew over backwards the stairs so the people can get up there. I think it ended up, on the incident report, it was two minutes and 33 seconds, how long from the first time I punched till – they got in there and got every, got it all situated. Uh, it was 27 Mexicans and I think seven whites that were actually took to the hole. So, I mean, were the white dudes stabbing back or no? I don't think it – I'm not for sure. I didn't have nothing on me at the time. Um, I think a, a dude got poked, a Mexican guy got poked that was trying to run away from the situation. Um I didn't hit anybody myself because I, because the thing was, I had three of them. Like I was the only one that, that was involved in it that stayed on their feet. Like the guy from Boston, Mike, dude named, they called him Matt, uh, Matt Mike. Crazy. He was kind of, he jumped, he seen what was going on and ran up there and uh, he got hit in his lungs, man. And, you know, I had to do was wrapped around me and had that thing off in me. And I just latched onto him so they couldn't get behind me. We were on the walkway. And uh, I kept bouncing back from the rail to the wall so they couldn't get behind me. And there was another dude from – he was a skinhead guy. And I think he's from Utah. I can't remember his name. He, uh, he was on the other end fighting them off, trying to get to the, from the other side. And Chucky was getting another – Chucky was getting the older Boston dudes out the way. So they so blocking them from that end, I think, is what happened. 
Was there a bunch of Pisces in the unit? Obviously. Absolutely. The the only thing for real, to be honest with you, to save my saved our life that day was the fact that normally you would see the Serenos and stuff get involved in that. They stayed out of it. They didn't get involved in it. Good thing they didn't, because if they did, it probably would have got bad, right? Yeah, it probably would have got bad. That's the one thing I always realized about the Pisces too, bro, or Hispanics, Mexicans in prison in general. When something happens, dude, it's like they're all going. Because if they don't, Absolutely. somebody's going to see you at another prison. You have to go, right? I mean, and that's that's another thing. Like, And once again, I'm gonna, I just want to reiterate, I don't glorify any of this stuff, right? I don't think anybody should go and do these type of things to anybody. I don't glorify it. But I think it's important that people understand what happens. The type of mentality you you get from that environment. Um, so in my mind, like when this was going on, I got to stay on my feet. I got to keep moving. I got to keep going. I got to make sure I look, you know, no, they don't get me. Right. So when it's all said and done, I'm, I'm, I'm standing, I'm standing there. My hands are busted. I got two broke hands at this time. Right. And I'm standing there and they get everybody. I'm seeing Mike, he's over there gurgling because he got hit in his lung. They're pulling these dudes off of him. And, uh, the cop comes over there and tells me, hey, man, you need to get on the stretcher. You know how that is. I'm like, I ain't going on. No, I'm walking out of here. I'm cool. Well, they let my buddy around me, and he said, hey, look, man, you need to look down and be just be cool. Well, I look down, and I see a little spot of blood on my head. What I didn't see is right here, it was just coming out of my deal. And as soon as I seen it, my legs gave out. I was like, dang. And then that's when they took us to the – me and Mike went to the outside hospital. Where did they hit you, in the liver? Yeah, right here between the ribs. And I know you said, you know, you're not glorifying it, but you know what I want people to understand, man, is this. I'm not glorifying it either, man. It's not a life that anybody wants to live, but there's yeah. some young dude right now from Missouri watching this, man. He might be a pretty big dude, might be yeah. six foot four, 250 pounds. There might be some young Mexican kid right now watching this. And what I want them to know is that they don't want to be in that position where they have to kill someone or where they That's stab someone. And they, they start out with 12 years and – or they got 46 days left to go home from prison and they yeah. kill somebody or they get killed. That's what it's about. It is. And that's the, that's why I contacted you because I think it's, I've watched a few of these shows and it's more, and I understand people want to, and I, and I think people need to hear this type of stuff, but I think it needs to be done in this type of way. You know what I mean? The people, people that were actually involved in it and that will admit what they did wrong. Why? Like you got people that were on the sidelines that didn't never push that stuff or didn't never do that, but they'll talk like they did. You know what I mean? And they'll ride on them coattails like that. <clears throat> and that's why I say it's like, you know, there's a, I learned a lot of stuff. I learned a lot of life lessons. I learned when to keep my mouth shut and when not to. I learned how to conduct myself with other people as a man, <clears throat> but I also learned how to be a, an animal too. And that's one of the things that, you know, stuck with me for a long time. So I say this, right, James, not on no tough guy shit, because I can get my ass whooped too, you know, but it's more of a, like you said, man, it is, man. It's it's life lessons. You learn how to deal with people, how to talk to people. You learn how to watch people and, and to recognize behavior and, you know, things like that. So although we spent all that time in prison, we did learn some things, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like now I know how to, so I work at a recovery center. There's like 40 guys at this time. And, you know, you we have to you have to know how to de-escalate situations without violence. And, you know, as well as I do in USPs, most times, unless it was a, every unless it was an organized thing, most things, if it kicks off like that, there's usually a piece of metal involved. So it got serious real quick. So what I learned from those situations is to try to to learn how to de-escalate things because I know how bad they can get, you know? When I finally made it to an FCI, I started thinking, I started to change my life too when I made it to an FCI. I'm like, damn, man, I was glad, man. Like, I'm out of the USP, you know, environment. And you know what? There were times when, and I think we all should know this, that sometimes people want a way out. When there's an issue, sometimes it's all right, man, to talk it out and not resort to violence, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I didn't learn that till after prison. I didn't learn that till after. Like, so in prison, I learned how to de-escalate it till you couldn't no more. If I'm trying, you know as well as I do, if we're trying to negotiate something and you're and you're pushing, I can only take that push so much, right? Until then now everybody thinks all oh, you're soft or whatever, and you have to react to that. But now I don't care about all that because it's not the same circumstance. 
You know? No doubt. I mean, people can think what they want, but you know what? At the end of the day, man, you've done things and you became an animal at, at, at some points in your life because you had to. That's what the environment dictates in there. But you've obviously changed your life, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that in a second. But you know something, and I'm not saying this in, in a bad way. I mean, you're a man. At the end of the day, you're still a man. But if there's situations where you can walk away, it's all right to walk away. Sometimes it's not worth it. I used to tell dudes in the FCI, like, some dudes would be like, man, I'm all right. I'm sorry, man. Pack your stuff. You ready? We're going to go kill them. What do you mean? No, we're going to kill them. If it ain't worth killing them over, it ain't worth arguing over. Let it go. Yeah. It ain't that serious, yeah. man. And I feel the same way here in the street, but, you know, you were once upon a time a gangster, and now you're a gentleman. But you still yeah. have that in you. It's still there if yeah. it has to come to that. But in the street, 99% of the time, it doesn't have to come to that. You can walk away. Who cares what people think, man? You're doing you. You're taking See, care I, of yourself. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Like, so whenever I left the SMU program, I went out to the world with that same mentality. And it, I didn't make it, you know. And uh, I didn't know how to deal with the world as the world. And even when I came here, like, I cut and I gave my life to Christ. My mind was so caught up, like, and I say this once again, not glorifying things, but when I left prison, I left in good standings, right? Um, so whenever I whenever I came here, something made me, I found my my original sponsor online and I contacted him and, and told him. I said, hey man, you know what? I gave my life to the Lord. Um, I'm not about this life no more. You know what I mean? Uh if I, I, I don't think I'm ever going back to prison. That's not my thing. But I was so, like, in my mind, I was a dirty white boy for the rest of my life. That's how my mentality was. because that, And I carried that all the way to the day I came here. And whenever I decided I can't serve two masters, right, I can't. I had When I gave my life to Christ, I was all in. That was it. I can't do this no more. So that's what I did. And that's what I've been doing since 2015. So, you know, the way that you were in for the homies and, and for the DWBs and, and the people that you felt like were your family, which, hey, man, I'm sure there's still people that you care about. Right. But it doesn't mean that you yeah. have to live that life. Yeah. And and like I and, and from some of the individuals that I started off I that I was in Beaumont with and I had made contact with a few times out here, um, they still met when they see things on Facebook. They'll message me and hope you're doing OK, because we live that life together. And it's different if, you know if you have a big old black blob on your body, right. Or somebody chops something off, you, you know, the difference, you know what I mean? And like, I went to this, I ended up in the smooth program because a police officer put their hands on one of my people and I jumped on the cop. So I didn't s stop believing. I just, I can't serve two masters. That life was real at the time, but Russo said some good things. He made a lot of sense when I heard him talking to you about that stuff. He said some good things. Yeah, I know he's got a little channel going now too, and you know he, he's got a, he's got a good message. And I just hope that he's on you know he stays on the right path and keeps doing the things that he's doing. But listen, man, now you're at this place. Tell the people how it all started and, and where you where you were at when you got there and where you are now. What you're doing. So before I came here in 2000, I'm, I'm in a Christian place called Heartland Recovery. I, well, I work for a place called Heartland Recovery Center. It's a Christian based community with about 300 people. We're uh, self-sufficient. We uh, well, basically, there was a gentleman that started Ozark Life Insurance in Kansas City, a real multimillionaire guy that started this place to give people a new chance at life. And uh, there's about 300 people to live here. We all live in the same community. Uh, the ministry provides housing and, and we work for the ministry. I work for the recovery for the men's recovery center. My wife works for the uh, women's recovery center. I came here in 2015. Um, but when I came here, I came here from county jail. I was facing a lot of time, dude. I had done some ignorant stuff and I thought I was gone for the rest of my life. And now I know God interceded because like when I tell you, I left that life in good standings. I left that whole criminal life in good standings too. I've never put anybody, uh, I've never sacrificed anybody to save myself or anything like that. And I tell you that because I go back into these jails and prisons now in Missouri and I'm able to do that because people know a little bit about my life. You know how, you know, prisons, people know you, they know your name and things like that. So um, when I came here, man, uh, 
I didn't know what to expect because I didn't change in prison. I didn't change in the world. I just wanted something different, but I didn't know nothing about God. So I was here about three and a half months before I finally realized that God was real and that 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 violent, angry animal that was living inside of me doesn't have to be there no more. So I started uh, I started to change, man. And I gave my life to the Lord and I started uh, uh, I got my first job. I was working at the we had a dairy farm here, man. And I was working there and I became a supervisor. And then when we sold the dairy farm, I ended up becoming the missions director for the recovery center. And I would talk to, dude, it was crazy. I would talk to prosecutors, judges, trying to get people out of jail, telling them about our program and things like that. And I would go to court for people and and get them out of jail and things like that. And uh, then we started going into the county jails around here. And then that led to us going into Ozark Correctional Center, which is in Fordland, Missouri. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's a uh, it's an 18 month uh, prison treatment center. It's a correctional treatment center. So anyway, we go into there. I was going into there teaching classes until all this COVID stuff hit and they, they kind of mellowed out. But uh, and now I'm a group leader for the recovery center. That's what's up, man. You changed your life, man. And. You're living your best life. You know, you said you were married. I seen the ring on your finger. How does yeah, it feel to yeah. be married, man, and just to be normal, bro, and not be living in you that know, prison environment? You know, this is the first relationship, technically the, the the really first relationship I've ever really been in. Most of my life was it was in prison, man. So it's like this is the first relation, real relationship I've been in. You know, you get a, I, you know, when I was 17, I got a girl pregnant, went to prison. I got out for six months, got another girl, went went to prison. So I've never really been in a real, real relationship. So coming into this, I, uh, I, uh, this is the first time that we had something built on reality, something real. So it was, uh, it's good. It's good, man. It's been good. How does it feel to wake up in your own bed and not in a prison bed when you wake up and you're like, damn, man, I'm locked in. Yeah, that's a lot. You know, I still, I have, there's a lot of things from the past that still I struggle with, with the way people talk to people the way people treat people. That's still something that I struggle with today. But a lot of that stuff's not even with me no more, man. Like it's God really helped me through that stuff. Like I struggle with a lot of, a lot of um, not being able to sleep, you know, uh, on a real bed and things like that. It was kind of all that stuff. People don't understand <clears throat> what that stuff does to your mind, man. Unless you spend a few calendar years in there, People don't understand how shell shocked or, or PSTD or whatever you want to call it. That stuff happens, man. It takes a lot of years to shake it off. Well, when we were talking, right, you're a believer in Christ. But when we were talking earlier and you were like, well, you know, I, it, you know, I've seen a lot of things and, you know, I've seen some bad things. I could see it, man, that in you, that it, it's still there. It obviously bothered you, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's All right, you know, man, say it. It's just those things, you know, I have to live with that stuff the rest of my life. Some of the things that I did to individuals and some of the things that I've watched. And I try to tell people, you know, I don't when I get into these kind of conversations, it's not a lot of people do that to boast about themselves, try to make themselves look tougher. <clears throat> and, you know, it's not about that. I think that people need to know you go in. I had a I had a gun case. Right. And I'm ended up, you know, I've had situations where people left in stretchers and you know, people are brain dead now and, you know, things like that. And we laugh about it. You know, it's just another day. It's just whatever. And I, I was sitting there. What got one, another thing, I don't know if you read, do you read most of your comments on your stuff? I read almost every single one of them and I respond to everybody. Okay. Do you, did you know there was a guy when you were talking to Russo and they were talking about um, the guy, the, the old school DWB that got hit in the cage by four guys in, in Tucson I mean, in uh, in uh, Lewisburg, did you read that comment? They were talking about Ronnie, a guy named Ronnie. I'm, I may have, but what I do is, like, I'll respond to all them comments, like, that day or the next morning. And then, you know, when the next video comes out, because I wouldn't have enough time. So I may, yeah. or, I may or may not have, bro. Yeah. Well, they were just talking about that. Ronnie got hit 53 times, you know, in that cage that day. He got hit 53 times. And uh, it was a two-stage thing. I was involved in the second part. Him and another guy messed up in uh, Victorville, and they did some stuff they shouldn't have done, so they ended up getting hit for it. How about Swift? You know Swift? 
talking about the, the ABT or the ABT Swift used to be a DWB, yeah. I think. I don't know. No, he if it if it's a Swift, I know he had a. He always wore a uh, like this. That's Swift, man. He's from really from Oklahoma. ABT. He, he started uh, with Bo he started in Beaumont with me. We hit that. We hit the yard at the same time. About as big as you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here you go. Bank, what was he bank robber or something? Yeah, that's him. He's about as big as you. Uh, just so you know, he's a believer in Christ now too. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He we were in the. It's funny, we uh something happened over there at Beaumont and there wasn't no cells. And there was three ABT dudes in a cell and they didn't have nowhere to put me. So I ended up going in there with him and three of his brothers. And we were like four or five deep in this cell over there in Beaumont. Scott Reisendorf, that's his real name. I, I can't remember, man. I can't remember. He was a dangerous dude once upon a time, man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like when you said like he he was a I, I would have never thought that he would have went a different route. Yeah, he did. He ended up going a different route. But anyway, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, dude. You've definitely been through some stuff. And, you know, it's not about that. What it's about now is what you're doing now, man. You're free. You're married. You know, you're doing big things over there. You're helping people. And instead of, you know, unfortunately, man, we can call it whatever we want, but victimizing people, now yeah. you're helping people, man. And maybe that's God's way of using you, man, to, uh, to make some retributions for the past, man, what you're doing now, right? Yeah, that's why that's that's one of the main reasons why I contact is, you know, because, you know, the thing is, is. Two things are going to happen with people like us, we think that we have to live like that the rest of our life. Right. We think that that's something we have to hold on to. Um, or you just embrace it or you, or you you embrace it and you just live like that the rest of your life. Or you try to go a different route like, oh, I'm doing good. I got a job. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I stay at the house. I'm doing this, but you don't interact with nobody. You don't interact in society because you don't know how. And the next thing you know, you're back on getting jumped out and you're back in a joint where you feel comfortable. And that's the sad part about it. It is sad. There's plenty of people that come on the show and talk about that. And I'm not going to lie to you, bro. I always say, man, I never want to go back, but there have been times where I was like, wow, man, it's kind of hard out here, man. You know, yeah. I thought for that, just for that fleeting moment, like, man, maybe, maybe I'm better off in prison. But I know and I'm, I, I'm not, man. I know that I'm not. And I've thought the same thing early off into this. Like I said, it's been seven years, man. And uh, statistically speaking, how long have you been out? 19 months. Okay. So normally people that done that type of time and stuff, they're usually back in within a year, in and out within a year, right? That's how normally statistics, statistic wise, that's how it usually happens. If you make it over that year, and you're living your life the right way, you got a heck of a chance to make it, right? And it's one of those things where, where for the first time in my life, I actually want to be comfortable out here. Like, I'm not jumping from dope house to dope house. I'm not looking for peace in a, in a bag or whatever, you know? And that's the thing that, that then people coming out of prison, they think that because it gets hard, like they can't find a job or they can't find a place to live or whatever that they revert, that that's all they know, how, that that's all you can do is go backwards. Well, that's not true. You don't have to just look at you. you. You got some stuff going on and you're reaching out to people on this YouTube thing. And, you know, I'm over here working. I'm going into courthouses and stuff like that, trying to help people. It's possible to move forward from that stuff. It's not that we have to forget where we came from. And I have a, I just, you know, I kind of hesitate. I still have that old thing inside me where I hesitate to speak on certain things. You know what I mean? I, it's just hard. I feel like, you know, it's that old mentality where I don't want to speak on certain things, you know, but it's just one of the, you know how that stuff is, man. Yeah. We don't have to talk in depth. We, you know, we, we talk about what we talk about. People get the message and they see what you've been through. <clears throat> they see what you're doing and, you know, I'm going to get ready to close the show, but I definitely appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you reaching out, bro. Number one. Number two, man, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and, you know, unfortunately reliving some of them experiences. Like with the book that I wrote today, I read some of the book on my channel and, you know, towards the end, I got a little choked up when I talked about my wife and my yeah. past life and, you know, being in that shower when we were locked down and just thinking about my family and punching the wall and I was crying and I tried to, you know, wipe the tears off my face so no one would see it when I walked out of the shower yeah. and had to put that tough guy armor back on, man. Yeah. But that wasn't what yeah. it was here, man. That's right. Let, before we go, there's two things real quick. You asked me like one of the things 
So I remember what you're saying. I was in Beaumont one time and, I, you know, when the doors popped, everybody had to be up, right? I'm sitting there in a pair of boxers, man, some things that happened with a different race with some D.C. individuals sometime that week, right? And we didn't know what was going to happen. And I'm sitting there with my shoes on. I have my hands in my head. I'm like, man, I'm done with this. Like, I was so stressed out. But I told myself, get up, you know, you got you, you got to toughen up. You got to get out there. You go out there, whatever. Right. And you know how many days were like that? And it was like, yeah, it, obviously you do. And I remember going. one of the main things that stick with me, man, is going when we went to that SMU program from Victorville. And I did you ever hear about the, the bus? They kept us at the airport. Somebody got hit at the airport and the sheriffs had the bus surrounded. Did you ever hear about that? Was that the kid that took the chain off and was hitting the dude on the yeah, bus? Yeah, hitting chain? Rosie in the back of the head. I was sitting right behind him. We're at the we're at the thing, man. And they done came up out the chains and were beating, trying to kill the dude on the uh, on the bus. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, oh, I've been on a bus. I've been on a bus where that happened, bro. I've seen it happen too. Yeah, but I know the I know the incident that you're talking about. Yeah, I was I was. Uh, they had us. They finally had to bring the outside SWAT team there, hit us with the pepper gas, hit the to get everybody calmed down. And the outside police department made the feds get us up off the tarmac because they wouldn't roll the bus. That Jesse, that wasn't Jesse Sprouse, was it? No, that was uh, it was Rosie that got hit. I know the incident, man. I mean, that was years yeah. ago, but I know the incident. I can't think of that. I can't remember the guy's name that did it. He used to run with some individuals that were at Victorville. I think that might have been Jesse Sprouse. But anyway, you know, before we close, man, I know you got a message, man, for, you know, some of the younger dudes that are on the wrong path right now, even younger women or maybe dudes that just got out of prison because of the, you know, the work that you're doing. And they might be in a position right now where like, man, fuck this, man, I'd rather be back in prison. What message would you have for a guy like that that thinks today he'd rather be back in prison? He's only been out 30 days. My, my worst day is still better than my best day from the past. Um, I wake up every day free now. Even when I struggle, it's better. I don't have to wake up and put a knife in my hand. I don't have to put a needle in my arm or a pistol in my waistband. There's hope. I didn't re I didn't realize there was hope till I gave my life to Christ, right? I didn't realize there was hope, but you don't you don't have to live like that the rest of your life. I don't care what anybody's indoctrinated into your mind. You don't have to hurt people the rest of your life. You don't have to hate people because of their color or whatever they got going on. You don't have to do that, man. You don't. You don't have to be. You don't have to call everybody lames and and walk around this world trying to be a. It, there's certain morals everybody's got to walk with, right? I understand that, but you, our life doesn't have to consist of being a a stand up dude and everybody else being lames. Like that's the one thing that you don't have to. You don't have to walk around with all that pride all the time because that's what gets us in the end. That pride, man, kills us every time. Pride can get you killed or get you a life sentence, right? Absolutely. But you're, like I said, because I was trained like an animal when somebody called me out their name, out of my name, you know, I got hit in the liver and some other individuals almost lost their life because that's how I was trained. Mentally and physically, I was trying to go, you know, and that stuff, you don't have to live like that the rest of your life. I, I encourage people to, to uh, learn how to communicate with people. Learn how to interact in society. Don't shut yourself away from people like we do in prison, right? Well, you're not, if you get out here, get around people, learn how to communicate, you learn how to do things like this, like this YouTube stuff, become a part of something. My main thing is I'm going to tell you is always go to church, man. Try to find somebody that's living a better life that can help you find Christ, man. You can find Christ anywhere. Don't get me wrong, but get involved in a church body. No doubt, man. I'm no, you know, back then you would never have probably thought in your wildest dreams that no. six foot four DWB James would end up, you know, part of God's team, right? No, you know, back when I was incarcerated, my nickname was Lumpy. That's what they used to call me, right? I've been called that my whole life. And now my name's James. That's what I go by. But no, you know, I used to, when I was in Beaumont, Texas, I used to watch, that was the only table in the whole penitentiary that Mexicans, whites, and blacks could eat at together was the Christian table. I used to laugh at these dudes, right? They're walking around with books. We're walking around with bone crushers, right? Who was tougher? They had a book, you know? And I used to be like, man, what's up with these dudes, right? And then I look back and I'm like, they had to figure it out. They had to figure it out. No doubt, man. Hey. They had to figure it out. 
James, I'm going to close the show, man. But once again, man, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming on. I wish you all the best in life, man. And I would like to stay in contact with you because you are, you, you know, you come across as a really good dude, man. So, again, man, thank you for There's coming a, Maybe we can do this again. We'll, we'll talk about a few other things, man. Uh, I've seen some things on your uh, – I'll contact you at a later time. I've seen some things that you talked about that I was in, that I seen that I, I can speak on with you too. And we'll talk about it or something. But I'll stay in contact with you, man. Blessings to uh, everything you got going on. I hope you succeed, man. And congratulations on your kids and everything, man. Thank you, man. So that's it. We're going to close the show, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share this video because there's really a message here. With respect, until tomorrow, we're out. Thank you.